Radio Rahim sitting here in Macau, China with none other than Larry Merchant. You know, I've talked to you a couple times before you came to Macau for Zhao Shiming's first and second fight, and I have to admit, I was jealous. I didn't get to come. So to be sitting here with you this time uh, is a pleasure for me. Uh, thank you. I, I, I like saying to people or messaging them, uh, I'll see you in China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite an experience. And this time, if I were to come anytime, this was the time to come. There's been so many fireworks, so much backstory to this fight. Um, I'm assuming that by now you've heard about the melee that took place yesterday. Before I even ask you any pointed questions, what are your general thoughts on that? Uh, a potent mixture of... Uh, Gymnasium, testosterone, and bad blood. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, you've known both camps for a while, imagining Freddie Roach for even longer. Um, did it surprise you at all how he reacted to that situation? I don't, I'm not a first hand uh, guy there, but you know, almost everything that goes uh, on before a fight is a kind of dominance ritual in which each side tries to show that they can dictate the terms and hope that in some way that transfers to what happens in the ring which it never does or maybe it's just to remind themselves that they're the boss um, so I put it all in that context well turning to what does happen in the ring you know Brandon Rios is coming off a loss but it was a 12 round decision a close fight whereas Manny Pacquiao is coming off a devastating knockout with those two kind of mindsets both guys being hungry how do you see this fight shaping up first of all with the mental uh, chess game and struggle that goes on in there you know it's hard to say um, they're both professionals uh, certainly Rios being younger coming back off a decision defeat which happens when you fight uh, top flight opponents um, I don't think that's going to affect him in any way I think that we don't know about uh, Manny Pacquiao it's rare that a veteran champion comes back whole from that kind of a knockout so what we don't know is how that mix works out whether it's the testosterone and bad blood from the gym that transfers into the ring. With Floyd Mayweather having been successful in his last mega fight against Canelo Alvarez, and let's assume for a moment that Manny Pacquiao is successful against Brandon Rios, is there enough time on Manny Pacquiao's career or a situation that could arise where he might still have a shot at grasping the mantle of best fighter of this era because he's best fighter of the decade but I guess that might even be arguable by now uh, I don't know who confers those titles <laughs> uh, everybody has their their own ways of deciding those things um, look when did Tyson fight Lennox Lewis there have been a number of occasions when for reasons that usually that you, usually have to do with money uh, a fight that everybody wants gets kicked down the road and um, where if Manny should win this and win this uh, in style uh, will it regenerate um, discussions of that sure but the same reasons why it hasn't happened will still be in play which is that both of them are making so much money without having to fight each other that there's no great urgency about it. You know, you know, <laughs> you'll have to forgive me for constantly putting you uh, on hypothetical matchups, but everybody loves to hear your take on these things. So there are two fighters vying, it would seem to be the next big thing, the future of boxing. I think they both called themselves this, and that would be Adrian Bronner and Canelo Alvarez. Two vastly different personality types, both uh, with the same promoter. How do you size those two up uh, in contrast to each other, their approach to, to the game? And then who do you think has the best shot at actually becoming the future of boxing, if, if it is one of those two? Mikey Garcia. <laughs> uh, there we go. <laughs> Why? Because I think that um, he, he uh, to me, is the embodiment of what 
uh, a professional prize fighter should be. Uh, he should box and bang and know, know when to do either one and do them both with skill and, and desire. And lastly, uh, being here in Macau, China, I, we have to discuss the international turn that, if not boxing as a whole, certainly top rank is trying to take uh, boxing in this direction. How do you feel about boxing on a global stage like this? And is that good? Is that the future of the sport? Are we going to start seeing more things in Europe and whatnot that translate into America and, and fans here? I think with modern communications and the globalization of many sports, basketball and hockey, for example, um, that, yeah, there's a more of a curiosity. We're seeing now the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming, how many good Russians are entering the scene. And for the boxing fan, um, there's curiosity about that, whether that translates into an international audience as Pacquiao aroused, that's, that is extremely uh, rare. And uh, we have to remember that uh, the thriller in Manila happened, um, you know, what, over 35, nearly 40 years ago. It didn't mean that there were many more thriller in Manila, two, three, four, and five. So, um, but this is a new time. And um, the fact that this Macau has become this um, mecca of gambling and that in the gambling world and the boxing world somehow a mix and that um, perhaps there will be a, an infrastructure and more Chinese fighters uh, following Ximing. So, you know, we're not sure where it goes. You know, uh, before Pacquiao, there was almost a, a century of Filipino fighters. Some of them really good fighters who fought all over the world. Uh, that he, he, he emerged from that uh, tradition. Uh, how long does it take to build a tradition? Well, I'm not sure, but they built Macau in 10 years. They, they <laughs> You're right. And this is like the Vegas <laughs> off the Hong Kong coast, right? Is this thing not exactly like Las Vegas? <laughs> so um, I've seen a documentary in which there are now boxing academies and, and instructors taking kids when they're young. And um, we're seeing now, for example, how in all the former Soviet republics, where that infrastructure built during the time of uh, the Soviet Union and communism and uh, is now turning out serious professional prize fighters. So maybe the Chinese will, will do it faster than anybody thinks. And, um, and remember, there's, there's, Thailand has a lot of boxers and uh, Australia. So um, it's global. And Larry, you've been around for so many eras, if you will, ebb and flow in this sport. You've seen them come, you've seen them go. What if there were one issue with boxing that you could fix if you had the magic wand before you, you got out of here and left it to the next generation? You know, what would it be? Obviously, the criticisms are around the division in the promoters. Um, you know, PED use and, 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 and the weight issues. Um, there are the judging issues that get raised often. What do you think would be the singular most beneficial fix in this sport, if you could fix one thing? Um, fighters who don't want to fight get penalized for it. Whether it's running or whether it's holding. Interesting. I did not see that coming. <laughs> see, you always surprise me. I always learn something. A Larry Merchant. To me, oh, go ahead. To me, the difference between boxing and prize fighting is prize fighting includes boxing, but it's boxing and banging. And it's not just a sport. It's, it's a business. It's entertainment. And if fighters don't want to fight, 
if they come into the ring with the idea of making nothing or very little happen, then they have to be penalized. Very interesting. I appreciate it. Always appreciate the time, Larry. Radio Rahim with Larry Merchant.